I call synthetic you, data. <laughs> yes, thank you, everybody. Um, so yes, I will tell you a short story about one of the experiments we've been doing with synthetic data in our industry. But before I do so, I kind of want to take you back to the beginning of 23. In the beginning of 23, when you were Googling the famous painter Edward Hopper, you would get this typical result, you know, typical result for whenever you Google an artist. Only the lady in red that you see is not really a painting from Hopper. It was an image generated by AI in the style of Hopper. And I really love this case because of two reasons. I think, first of all, it shows how impressive generative AI can be. But on the other hand, it also shows some of the challenges. You know, for people that were using these results, it wasn't clear that this was a fake image. Moreover, people go to search engines and they expect them to be reliable, you know, telling the truth. And hence, for them, it wasn't clear that, you know, that was actually not the reality. And it raises questions on moving forward in this whole synthetic world. What is still the truth, right? So then maybe moving to our own industry, if you think about the idea of synthetic data, you know that can be quite appealing. Um, maybe just for clear understanding, if I refer to synthetic data in our industry, I'm referring to the most often use case where instead of collecting primary research data, you know, where you interact either through a survey or qualitative research with real people, you're instead generating synthetic fake participants, and then you ask your research questions to those, usually through a chat interface. So that's the two things I want to compare. And if you think about it, you know, it can be appealing. Think, for example, about the speed. You know, it could be just, you know, taking minutes, hours to get your results versus maybe days or weeks. It could be cheaper. But also, maybe, it really, to the point of the previous speakers, helps us to solve some of the problems in our industry when it comes to fraud, or maybe privacy, you know, artificial people, you know, much easier to deal with, probably, and to control. So, we thought it was an interesting thought, and we said, maybe we need to investigate this a bit better. And this is actually where our internal AI program has been coming in. So at Humanate, as the beginning of generative AI was happening, we have been embracing the change, and we have largely done two things. The first thing is we have organized a prompt school, so an internal training program, where our entire staff has been retrained um, on um, yeah, generative AI in general, but also prompting, prompt engineering for the insight industry. Second of all, and this is really important, we kind of made an own piece of technology allowing us to experiment in a safe way. So like also Michelle was saying, it's really important that, especially when you work with confidential data, that you're not sharing that with public systems out there. And using the systems, we've been setting up actually quite a lot of experiments. And one of them has been specifically on synthetic data. And that's the one I want to talk to you about um, today. So what have we done? This was actually a study in the automotive industry where we wanted to find out more about barriers, triggers for people to buy an electric car. It was focused at branding, communication, and so on. And like in every experiment, we had two conditions. So we had the conditions of uh, the research community. So this was a research community we set up with a little bit more than 80 real human beings, people, research participants coming out of the UK. All of them had an intention to buy um, an electric car, or were at least um, yeah, considering it. Um, and they took part in um, it a little bit more than a, a week, deep qualitative discussions. So real people with a real human moderator. And then we kind of contrasted that with exactly the same thing, but only using synthetic persona. So synthetic persona leading to synthetic data. Uh, and that is what we did uh, using our own um, technology. Um, maybe before I show you the results, because that's eventually what we did, um, let me just explain you a little bit more what I mean to and how that process go went when coming to this creative perso uh, synthetic persona and synthetic data. The first thing I want to point out is that when we started this experiment, we took the same sampling criteria as for our research community, and we tried to mimic that as closely as possible using, you know, uh, the synthetic uh, data. And I must say, um, our first attempt was quite disappointing. You see the result here? So yes, I got nicely back. I asked for a little bit more than 80 people, UK people, synthetic personas. I got them back, 
But I found personally that the description was very plain. You know, I asked for people in the UK, a bit of a mix of say, socio-demographics, they had to be into buying electric, uh, electric cars, but I thought it was very repetitive and not very human, you know? The same hall, so for every persona, synthetic persona we were, or participant we were generating, we also wanted to get a bit more like, you know, flesh to the bone description on them. So we asked them, tell me for this persona, also the story on why they're planning to buy an electric car. And to be fair, I only got like three different main reasons. All of them were kind of the same. Um, so we thought, you know, let's add some maybe soil to the data. You know, it's not really like representing real humans. Um, and that is where I think also the, the art and skill of and creative, um, I would say, task of prompt engineering is coming in. Because in large uh, or in, in big lines, what we did is we did two things. Um, we, on the one hand, uh, played a bit with what we call the cognitive load. I don't want to make this technical on, uh, on prompt engineering. But basically, one of the tricks you can play with is the amount of information you ask to generative AI system will influence the output that you get in. It's often linked to token limitations and how much data it can process, and it will help your generative AI system to focus more on what it's supposed to do. So if you play with that, usually you can get better results. The other thing is um, what I like to, to call the, the creativity index, for people that are a bit more familiar, it's also called temperature. It's basically the degree to which you want the model to be like very narrow and like very conservative versus um, let it um, allow for more um, error, let's say. And that often leads to more creative answers. And after that process, I must say we got, well, we got, Yes, much better uh, results. Um, so, um, um, yeah, if I looked at the descriptions, they were no longer so plain. So you see here two other examples, and that's how I nicely got 86 of them. Um, and also when it comes to drivers, personality descriptions of just those personas, so even before doing the research then, they were a lot more, I would say, uh, human-like. Now, why am I all explaining this to you? It's just to make the point that AI really needs human eyes. And I think it's very tempting to say, you know, there's an out-of-box of solution, it's creating generic or genetic um, synthetic data for me, um, without maybe having no conversation on, you know, what prompts have been given, what decisions have been made about my sample. Because it is really an iterative process, and depending on how you will prompt it, what settings you will set, you will get very different results. And at least it's important if you use synthetic data, that you ask those questions to your provider or maybe have the knowledge itself and make conscious decisions about what you're, you're going to use as a starting point for your um, synthetic data. So back then to our experiment. So as I said, so we did um, the community data. We contrasted them also with our synthetic data. So what we did is literally the same activities and questions that we asked to the real people were asked also to the synthetic persona. And then we got the output and we uh, compared them. Um, I'm going to take you to uh, two results. Um, the first one I want to talk about is first car story. So we had a whole topic which was all about, let's yeah, talk about the first car you ever had and what was the story about it. Here you see the results from the synthetic data. So these are UK people. Um, we kind of clustered also using AI, by the way, the segments into different, um, or the, the stories into different segments. And there are four types of segments. So basically, we had people that said, you know, I got my first car when I went to university. It was really about being independent. Um, I had road trip and uh, camping. That was the main reason why I got a car. So about adventure and exploration. Um, a group that was more like business oriented. You know, I got my first job and I wanted to have like a way to get there, but also like more fancy car to show that I was now a professional um, human being uh, and successful in life. And then you had people talking about um, their cars as being, you know, more unique, vintage, and hands like um, in link with maybe their personality and uh, identity. So these were the segments we were getting um, out of synthetic data. Not sure what you think of it. Let's maybe have a look at what came out then of the community. So if you look at the community, yes, um, we actually saw quite some differences. So the first thing that was striking is that some of the segments we did not find back. So we didn't have anybody who was talking about camping and exploration 
out there, nor did we have people talking about, you, might, you know, my first car was more of a vintage car, a special car that was a reflection of my personality. We didn't have it. That doesn't mean that they're not there, but it just didn't pop out. We also had quite some new segments that didn't keep out of the synthetic data. So for example, um, we had quite some people who were saying, you know, the first car, that was already actually planning for the next um, part of my life where I'm planning to have a family. So it had to be a big car, comfortable, thinking ahead. There were also lots of negative stories <laughs> when it comes to, um, to cars, you know, they have problems, they break down, there are accidents, people are learning, they have scratches. So it was not all that positive, all the car, all the stories that we were getting out. And then finally, there were also quite a lot of nuances. So um, when it came to uh, independence, yes, we had this, like, my car is my freedom, but it was not necessarily linked to university or going to university. The same with, like, commuting to work. Most people got actually a very small car, cheap car, to get to their first job, not like showing like how you're successful. And what this um, led us to conclude is actually um, two important things. I think first of all, you don't know what you don't know. Um, the synthetic data, yes, can give you interesting results, but you see that the human data help you to validate, maybe to nuance, to augment to that view. The second thing is that our impression was really, and we have been seeing that also in other studies, um, that the synthetic data gave really more of a picture perfect representation of reality. It's more like how people want to be. You know, I'm successful, my new job, here is a more fancy car, I buy like this more unique car. Whereas, you know, the reality of life is not always that pretty and perfect. And that's also not surprising if you think about where the data are about that this you know, large language models are trained on. For example, ChatGPT, it's the internet, and that's typically where people kind of share more like who they want to be, what is they want to come across like. So it's more like their desired image than maybe how things really are. And that is also what we saw in a second uh, part. Um, so one of the other exercises with it that I want to share is like the classic projective technique where you do a brand personification. So basically you ask if you would be this brand and that brand would be an animal, what kind of animal uh, would it be and why? Um, and we kind of contrasted it. We also used um, some uh, yeah, AI, so DALI, to just generate for us uh, the images. Um, and just showing this uh, one for Land Rover. So for Land Rover, what we, for example, saw is that based on the community data and the synthetic data. It was both a lion, so all about powerful, about reliable freedom, quite striking from that point of view. But we also found that, at least for UK people, um, still a lot of the heritage of Brand Rover, it's on survival, off-road, big, sturdy. Whereas if you looked at the synthetic data, it was much more like state-of-the-art technology, a luxury car, um, very eco-friendly, a very different image, and probably an image maybe which is more to what they want to evolve to, or what's like their, their image maybe of the future, versus maybe what pe people really always felt uh, about. Um, a last example maybe to also um, explain here, this is uh, one of my favorites, it's Tesla. Um, so for Tesla, of course, this is about fast, powerful, reliable, it's a cheetah again, very striking in both cases. It's a cheetah, um, but um, we saw that in the synthetic data, it was a lot about luxury, family-oriented, whereas in the real data, we had bold, daring, in-your-face, wild, a lot associated actually also in the probing with Elon Musk. And that is also something um, to just be aware of, uh, the synthetic data. In this case, they were going back to ChatGPT. So the internet of 21, of before 21, at that moment, Elon Musk didn't take over Twitter X. He was not so prominent yet into yeah, whatever that happens in his life in the last uh, years. And hence, we did not see it as what uh, reflected in the synthetic data, whereas in the real human data, which were obviously in the here and the now, we saw it coming out uh, much more uh, closer. Which shows also that, of course, um, you have the time difference um, and uh, yeah, just the time span of the, the language models uh, or the data behind it. Um, so AI, from our point of view, really needs also human data. And this brings me maybe to three lessons uh, learned. Um, first of all, 
Do I think that synthetic value uh, data have value? Well, I do think they can be great for kickstarting your project. I do recommend it, uh, if it's no synthetic data or just using any generative AI, that you use it maybe to set hypothesis to kind of see what's out there as a first starting point for your research. Second of all, educate yourself. Make sure that you have a base on maybe prompt engineering, that you have some knowledge on what's behind those systems, because this can really help and influence the results you get, but also in conversations maybe you will have with some of the synthetic data providers. It's after all a kind of sampling they're doing for you. And yes, you need to know like what kind of rules have they been applying to get to their results. And last but not least, decide on your source of truth. You know, um, learn about the power of synthetic data maybe for your brand, for your industry, for your sector, but also know when to complement it with real human data to give a more complete, uh, I would say, picture of reality, to get the total perspective and um, to have a better view of, I would say, the truth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annalise.